We're back here at the NRA National Firearms Museum here at NRA headquarters for our last in our series with Logan Medish and Erin Sabatini. Let's not forget about her. She was part of this series here. Great stuff you guys have brought. And Logan, this is the last one you have. And this is a very interesting firearm. I already have some thoughts and questions on it, but I'm gonna let you go first. Okay. Since you're you're, you're the museum guy, then I'll pepper you with some questions. Well, they, what you do know, we have? Well, they say <laughs> save the best for last, right? Uh, and I'm a Civil War buff, and so to me, this is the best for last, even though we've gone through a couple other Civil War era pieces. But this is a Sharps slant breech carbine, and it's one of about 900 guns that in the 1850s, up in the Northeast with the abolitionists, were purchased and packed into wooden crates, marked as Bibles, so that they could travel through the mail undetected. The ATF would have a field day with that today. Wow. Uh, so they called them Beecher's Bibles after the abolitionist uh, uh, Beecher up there. So it found its way uh, to bloody Kansas, fighting a turf war out there as to whether or not Kansas was gonna be admitted to the Union as a free state or a slave state. Mm. So this gun has a lot of history then. Wow. But then it's one of 75 guns that finds its way back east. And it finds itself in the hands of an eccentric gentleman. He thought of himself as a visionary, uh, but many of his contemporaries thought he was kind of eccentric. And if you see photos of him, he looks a little eccentric too. Uh, but he takes this gun and a number of pikes and thinks he's going to start a slave uprising and attack Harper's Ferry Arsenal, then in Virginia, of course in present day West Virginia. The man is John Brown. This is one of the 75 guns that he had with him when he raided Harper's Ferry Arsenal, right. October 18th, 1859. Of course, it doesn't go so well for John no, Brown. it did not. No, he finds himself cornered in the firehouse there by Lieutenant Robert E. Lee, who of course a few years later gives up his commission in the United States Army and goes to head the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Now they want to make an airtight case against John Brown, and so Obviously, they arrest him, they confiscate the weapons, and they read the serial numbers into the congressional record so they know what guns he had with him. Obviously, the case is airtight. John Brown hangs by the neck a couple months later. They write a great song about him moldering in the grave. And this gun fades into obscurity. It resurfaces in the early 90s in an antique shop in the Shenandoah Valley. Wow. Now, I mentioned that in 1859, they read the serial numbers into the congressional record so we know exactly what guns he had with him and the serial number on this gun matches. It is, in fact, one of the 75 that John wow. Brown had. We can place it in his men's hands. And, and, and somebody who had that in an antique shop probably had no idea what they had. Probably had no idea. Yeah, either they knew that it was a Civil War gun, what gun it was, sure. or just thought they had a cool old rifle and they had right. no idea. And that's, and that's the thing of it, is the serial number is supposed to be on this gun in two places. One in a very obvious spot on the top of the gun, the other one under the forearm. At some point, someone removed the serial number from the more obvious spot of the gun. Now, whether or not they thought they were trying to erase history, I don't know. But they obviously weren't smart enough to know that it was in two places. Wow. So when we took the forearm that, off of the gun, we found the serial number that's and knew it. Almost a, 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 a whole other story in itself to figure out why that happened and why that was done. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we may never know, uh, but you're right, a very neat story to that, too. So my one question about this, other yes. this huge amount of history and provenance, it's awesome. On the other side of that rifle, this is like a, what is that for? Yeah, this, because it's a carbine, uh, so this is your carbine sling and, and uh, ring. It's designed, this gun is supposed to be used by cavalrymen, and so they would clip it to their, uh, their cavalry, uh, slip it to their carbine sling so that it crosses over their shoulder and it can hang right. down off the side of them and the horse. Uh, so that they don't have to ride around carrying this right. gun all day. Right, slinging a ring, that's yeah, clever. Exactly, and you know, as a guy that carries one of these and does Civil War reenacting, it's very handy to have that ring on there so that you don't have to ride around carrying the gun all day long. So That's a beautiful thing, nice stuff. Logan, thank you so much. Absolutely. How can folks come and see this, this treasure and others like it here in the museums? This gun is on display in our Civil War exhibit at the NRA National Firearms Museum at NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. You can also find a wonderful selection of firearms at the NRA National Sporting Arms Museum at the Bass Pro Shops headquarters in Springfield, Missouri. And heading further west, you can go out to the Frank Brownell Museum of the Southwest at the NRA Whittington Center in Raton, New Mexico. Some great guns out there. And you can find all of it online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at nramuseums.com and in a variety of social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, it's all there for you. There you go. Logan Medish with the NRA Museums. Thank you, sir, for what you do, and thank, thank you for being on NRA News. Thank you, John.